Okay. So one summer, there was a Michelangelo Antonioni film festival at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and I, I went to see a lot of those films. Um, this is a still from Red Desert, his first film in color. It stars um, the, the wonderful Monica Vitti. Uh, and she, her character is very vulnerable in the film. She's, she's constantly you know, struggling with neuroses, clinging to walls, like literally being uh, lost in fog. And she's shown uh, often dwarfed by these giant industrial structures. So she seems like very small. And there's something about her character that I could empathize with. Also, that landscape really reminded me of the neighborhood we were, we were then living in in Brooklyn, Red Hook. I was down by the piers, not really close to the trains, kind of off the beaten path. Uh, and there were all these aband abandoned warehouses. And you go down to the piers and find like all sorts of you know crazy junk. There were also like chickens and stuff around. It was just very different from other neighborhoods in Brooklyn. And this is um, titled Red Hook. It was a, a painting about that particular place. So there, there's not much preparatory work for, for any of the paintings, even, even now, uh, but especially not then. And basically what I had was you know, a very large pool of source material. And I would add or subtract different elements to a painting you know, until it reached the right temperament. I would start with, say, one image of a landscape or an interior. And then uh, it was kind of like a cooking process. I would, I would gauge what the painting needed if it needed something you know, a little darker uh, or a little sweeter or a little you know, sort of messed up. Then, then I would add that thing. Uh, and you know, even if something entered the painting for a really short amount of time, uh, it would influence the things that happened next. So, so this started as a painting of a, of a sugar mill. And then that shape, the cylindrical shape, emptied out and became a window, uh, sort of like a door that I could put anything behind. Um, around this time, I was traveling back and forth between Brooklyn and, and uh, rural northern Michigan. We would uh, work in the winter in Brooklyn and try to make up you know, save as much money as possible, and then live super, super cheap, like rent a super cheap house in, in northern Michigan and, you know, just try to paint. Um, so this is the studio I had, had up there. Uh, I like to plaster my walls with my source material and uh, a little fragment of the Old Faithful Inn from Yellowstone sort of slipped into the studio scene. More and more, these uh, anomalous moments would come into a composition. And you know, as, as a way of explaining them to myself, uh, like a little story that I could tell to, to justify their appearance, I, I would consider them a kind of magic. But I thought of, of the magic for, for the inhabitants that live there as a kind of boring magic that, that no one would really care about. So something anomalous would happen, but it would be super dull that you wouldn't even you know, like bother to really check it out. Um, I was thinking for, for us in our world, it would kind of be the equivalent of like watching water animate a fountain, something you know, very familiar, but kind of a little bit, a little bit exciting. Uh, this is essentially a city painting. Um, I like how uh, every, everywhere in a city, it always feels to me like I'm outdoors. Even when I'm indoors, it's something about the, the proximity of everything. You know, everyone's close, the buildings are close, um, you know, you always hear your neighbors' TVs through the wall and their arguments. You always smell like their cooking smells, and all those experiences sort of sift through one another. And you know, you're influenced by that. Even especially in the summers, everyone pours outdoors and you know brings their TVs outside. And in our neighborhood, at least, not in Manhattan, but uh, in Brooklyn, that would happen a lot. Uh, I wanted the paintings to feel. Like they were infused with a kind of potential energy, like that anything could happen, uh, and, and that it was about to happen, or or something had just happened and you missed it. Um, and the, the special thing, the special event, wasn't really important. The, the the magic and the and the special part was the anticipation and and getting excited and being right on that edge. I felt like. Um, that feeling 
was tangible. It was it was something you could touch, and it was like a residue on like a sticky a sticky sensation. Uh, this painting is titled Sidecar. I was thinking a lot about travel uh, and looking out a train window and looking at a display case and how those two separate kinds of viewing experiences are, are very similar to me. They're, they're both private viewing experiences and you're like you're in your own individual viewing booth. I wanted things to feel both really familiar and also um, a, a bit uneasy, so that uh, there, there was a little bit of a sense of anxiety. And I found that if you, if I, if I combined very disparate kinds of elements, it would create that kind of anxiety. I had this idea in my head that you'd be, you know, go, going through your life, and you something would get caught in the corner of your eye that you couldn't shake, and that would be like a, a troubling thing, like a, like a memory that you don't want to remember, but you you can't you can't get away from it. Um, more and more, these split compositions kept on happening. <clears throat> in, in, my, in my mind, I, I thought of them as different versions of the same thing uh, being visible at the same time. It, it could also be like a pro progression, of, progression in time, like a before and after, or like film frames, one and then the other. Um, it, it also came out of a desire not to choose, wanting to see more than one of my ideas happen at the same time, um, and not, not wanting to feel the longing for not choosing the thing, you know, and feeling like I had misstepped. It, c it came partially out of indecision, I, I suppose. Uh, so the paintings start to become a little more cluttered at this time. Uh, things were really tumultuous in my, in my personal life, and uh, a lot of change, a lot of like disarray. And I felt that started to manifest itself as clutter in the paintings. And emptiness and clutter uh, became like polar forces that were, were dueling in the paintings sometimes. This is one of the first paintings I met, uh, made at the Workspace program, which was a nine-month residency uh, run by the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. And they give you studio space in these unused office buildings down in the financial district. Um, and, it, and the studios felt like that. They were a little nonspecific, you know, industrial lighting, very tunnely, you know, that terrible drop ceiling that they all have. Um, but I really liked it because I like being sort of like cramped. <laughs> it psychologically feels right. Um, let's see. Around this time, I would uh, work on a number of paintings at the same time. I would jump, uh, basically about 10 or so, I would jump from one to another fairly rapidly. And, and this was a, a pretty good strategy for not getting too precious about any one painting or wanting to you know, shunt all my ideas into a single painting and smothering it. Uh, I found if I you know, jumped around, then I, I, I just had a more fluid and, and open process. Uh, every element in this painting felt like it was on its own plane of space, that it was a, like a bunch of playing cards that were all fanned out, and that all the elements were, were really anonymous, that they didn't have strong identities, so they had to be clinging together, like, like soap bubbles or something, to, to gather strength. Um, more and more this, or not more and more, but on occasion, this white void form would come into the painting. It acted as both an object and a space, um, it, it could be both menacing and, and very passive. Uh, and often it, it was hugely helpful for organizing those disparate elements together. So all, all through this time, we're doing tons of traveling uh, all over the country by car. Uh, and I was thinking about, th this painting's titled Migration. I was thinking about falling asleep when you're driving in a car or, or you know, falling asleep when you're reading a book and how the experiences of, of, of reading and then sleeping become layered on top of one another. This 
This is the painting title of a train. Um, I like putting the, these shaped insets into paintings. Uh, it's, it's another opportunity to have a painting inside a painting, to show a different view of something in, 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 within a painting. It also creates a kind of uh, a block, uh, an unknowable zone where you can't see behind. And that, for me, has a, has a feeling of mystery. I kind of thought of this painting as um, the place you might end up if you set out with no destination in mind, a kind of cul-de-sac somewhere. I was asked to uh, participate in this project called Parallelograms. It's an online project, and they pick an image on the web, and you, you get that image, and then you're meant to respond to it in whatever way. Uh, so my image was of a posed pit bull, like a professionally, you know, posed pit bull. And uh, I had been wanting to put, I, dog heads in a grid had showed up at some point, and I wanted to work with that again. Uh, and there's a little portrait of my dog in there as well. Okay, so as an undergraduate, I was studying uh, creative writing and painting at the same time. And uh, my, I wasn't a very strong writer. Uh, the structure of the story didn't really, uh, there was no structure. That was, <laughs> that was a problem. Um, and, and not much happened in the story. They had a meandering feel. Uh, mostly I wanted to describe you know, small moments as precisely as I could. Uh, my tendencies as a thinker, which might have been you know, cumbersome or annoying even in writing, made a little bit more sense with the painting, where you could see all these uh, disparate ideas at the same time. OK, so the next few paintings come from a, a, what I call the solar system series. Uh, they're very small, usually four by five inches or, or you know, thereabouts. Um, and they're roughly based on, on ideas about the solar system. Uh, whenever I got to a place and I didn't know how to start, I would often make a portrait of the moon, just as a way to you know, get going if I was not sure what to paint. Uh, sometimes these insets in the painting would uh, become even more important than the painting and eclipse it. I, I thought of the insets sometimes as uh, a legend in a map, like a key in a map that helps decode what's happening in the rest of the painting, um, or, or like a supplementary text, or like a, a footnote that got too big, and you know. Uh, working really small in that way really helped me sometimes to, to make clearer, more simple compositional choices. So um, one of my other uh, anecdotes for indecision and for, for clutter in the paintings, I, I started using a lot of tape. So I would you know, tape off large areas of the painting and then draw on top of them and, and draw, you know, cut into them with an X-Acto knife. There was something about uh, the liquid material and the fluidity of a brush mark against the, the sharp inside, incised edge of uh, the tape that, that had an interesting tension for me. I thought of tape as just another kind of brush. And now every time I, I paint, I have a huge, huge tape ball that ends up accumulating. Uh, tape also helped me um, throw a sort of wrench into the mix. Like uh, sometimes I'd paint a whole painting and then cut out, you know, cover a part with tape, cut out a specific kind of shape, and then paint another painting on top of it and take off the tape and, and not know exactly how those two paintings would interact. And that would sometimes show me, you know, things that were way more interesting than I could have intentionally come up with. So most of the paintings from the last uh, like three years or so were, were made on residencies. Um, uh, I, I find residencies to be very, very productive. And, and, and they're great, because you meet a lot of artists who you know, are all over the country, and then you get to make work in different kinds of places, and that can be you know, a really great experience. Um, Sarah was saying a little, but we, we started in Brooklyn, and then we went to Lopez Island, an island off uh, the coast of Seattle, and then we were in Wyoming, and then we, I was in upstate New York, and then we finally ended in Roswell, New Mexico, and uh, now we're in Miami. So it, it's been a, a bit of a chaotic couple of years, but, but positive. <laughs> 
Um, so this is a view of a studio I had at Yaddo, which is in upstate New York. Um, and one of the problems with residencies, I mean, I really like doing them, but uh, I get a lot of social anxiety when I'm meeting a bunch of new people. And uh, you know, it, you even go into the lunchroom, and it's like being in high school. And uh, it's a little stressful. So I had this really big studio. It's much bigger than I actually needed. So I built this uh, cave as a sort of panic room <laughs> against social anxiety. Uh, this is one of the first paintings I made when I got to Roswell. Usually I can't make a painting about a place until I, I've left it, left that location. Um, again, these kind of close, intimate spaces, but usually there's um, like an escape route somewhere in the painting. So, so Roswell was a really great residency. It was uh, its uh, most important feature that it was a year long, uh, and you can bring your family, which was really wonderful. Um, but when I was there, I, was, I felt like I was able to go very deep into the work. I became really fluent in my process. Um, I was thinking of this painting being in the spirit of Maurice Sendak's Where the Wild Things Are and um, the animated films of Hayao Miyazaki, where you we were able to go into your imagination, characters go into their imagination, and uh, that becomes indistinguishable from, from their actual lives. This is a, a painting of my of a friend's studio. This one's called uh, Gin Rummy. Another Roswell painting. OK. so. Um, I'd like to read a small excerpt from a short story. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of uh, backstory or a little bit of this story. Uh, so a, a couple, an elderly couple, is going to visit their, their son in a mental institution. Uh, and the, the disease that, the affliction he's suffering from, in the story they refer to as referential mania. This is, uh, the story's called Signs and Symbols. It's by uh, Vladimir Nabokov. OK, I'll try to not read this super fast. In these, rare, in these very rare cases, the patient imagines that everything happening around him is a veiled reference to his personality and existence. He excludes real people from the conspiracy because he considers himself to be so much more intelligent than other men. Phenomenal nature shadows him wherever he goes. Clouds in the staring sky transmit to each other by means of slow signs, incredibly detailed information regarding him. His inmost thoughts are discussed at nightfall in manual alphabet by darkly gesticulating trees. Pebbles and stains or sun flecks form patterns representing in some awful way messages that he must intercept. Everything is a cipher, and of everything he is a theme. All around him there are spies. Some of them are detached observers like glass surfaces and still pools. Others, such as coats and store windows, are prejudiced witnesses, lynchers at heart. Others, again, running water, storms, are hysterical to the point of insanity have a distorted opinion of him and grotesquely misinterpret his actions. He must be always on guard and devote every minute and module of life to the decoding of the undulation of things. I was really interested in, in the ideas in this story and, and terrified of them. The, the idea that everything in his world has a, an awareness and everything is more uh, vivid than the, the people, vivid and, and more threatening than the people in his life. Um, I like to think of the elements in my paintings as having an awareness as well. Um, everything, uh, the landscape has a consciousness and has opinions, um, and everything has the potential to act on everything else even emptiness. Um, I like to think of all the elements as sort of citizens in a community. And so every scene is like a frozen moment, a, a tableau of avant. Um, when I make a painting of a place I know very well, I want to think about all, all the experiences I had in that place and how I felt in that place. And people can't be in the scene, because if, if a figure was in the scene, it would tie it too directly to a specific moment or situation. And, and when people aren't there, then I'm able, able to inhabit that space whenever I want. So it's like a, a little box that that space is in that I can re-experience. 
Um, I'm fond of display cases and dioramas in museums. I'm interested in how uh, when you put something under glass, it can change the way you feel about it. It can make it feel um, more special or, or staler, more dead. And it, uh, it kind of feels like when you arrange things in a display that it's similar to painting. Like you look at each object and you think of its history um, and its meaning and, and its formal attributes and how those things interact. I like bathrooms. Um, <laughs> there's something pleasant about being in a small space alone. Um, Temple Grandin, she's a, a doctor of animal sciences and an autism activist. She made this machine called a hugging machine. And uh, basically, um, people go into the hugging machine, and they're, they're heavily padded, and it puts pressure on the body. And, and that becomes like a deeply calming feeling. Uh, she, she invented this machine after looking at cows in squeezing chutes, um, and those are like squeeds, uh, squeeds. <laughs> chutes that squeeze, and they put them in there to, um, to inoculate them and do other sort of veterinarian exams, but it makes the, the cows really calm. Um, I, I really like being in small spaces because psychologically they squeeze. Um, it it makes, makes me kind of feel like an animal in a nest, like having a space that's the scale of your body. Um, I have a memory of being a kid in my grandmother's house in her den. She had these really heavy, heavy curtains, and they get really hot in the sun, or not hot, but warm in the sun, and I would like wrap myself in them and pin myself against the wall really hard. <laughs> and uh, there's something nice about not being seen and being quiet in a place, still in a place and not doing anything, and you know, taking yourself out of, you know, out of sight, out of any sort of social arrangement and just being there. Uh, that I liked. There is the, the pleasure of, of disappearing just for a moment of your own choosing. Um, and I know that sometimes sounds like a, like a death wish, but it, it's, it's not. It, it's, it, for me, it feels like very, very pleasant and a, like a pause, like a, a place with no impulses. OK, so my process up to this point has been to pull together a lot of disparate sources. But I, more and more, I've been working from a single source that feels fragmented already. Like, this is one of those kind of images. This one's called uh, Big Spider Mosquito Weekend. This is a painting of a studio I had in Lopez Island. Um, the, the time on Lopez was really great. It wasn't a residency. It was, uh, we were just house sitting for, the, for a friend of ours for, for a number of months, and we had just like no money at all, super, super poor, but like endless time, um, which was wonderful. And they had um, an orchard on the property and all these berry bushes, so we made a lot of pies on the cheap. Um, but this is uh, one of my studio, the studio I had there. Okay. So I have uh, a proclivity for distraction. Um, I'm, I'm, more and more, it seems like it's very difficult to be present in a, in a moment. I always like end up someplace and not remember like the steps towards getting there, uh, and it, it, it actually makes me a very poor listener, which is too bad. Um. <laughs> but more and more, I've, I've resigned myself to this tendency and tried to embrace it and tried to become fluent in it, and, and I found that uh, it makes the paintings more, more calm and more direct. Uh, and instead of them feeling feeling more fragmented, they actually feel a little bit more coherent to me. This one's titled uh, Perry Mason. When I'm in the studio, it seems like everything, like the stories I've been reading and, and memories and imagination and, and anxiety all kind of sift through one another without hierarchy. And it it's better if I don't feel I'm in control. It, it's even better when I... Uh, don't feel like I'm painting. And, and Gustin, Philip Gustin talks about that a little bit, about the, the possibility of disappearing through the, through the process of painting and how that is potentially even a goal to be outside of yourself in that way. When I paint in a place, I want to think about uh, the way that place smells and, and the temperature of the air and all those really specific recollection, recolle recollections. Because um, I don't know how it does it, but it helps the painting come up with 
and feel more vivid. The photo itself, uh, oh, yeah, this is what I want to talk about. The, the experience of, of the painting becomes more vivid and, and more alive than, than the photo for sure that I'm working from, uh, but also more vivid even than the experience that the photo represents, in this case being in front of this object. Uh, when I shoot for source material, I shoot really haphazardly and quickly. I'm not thinking about composition and I'm, not, I'm trying not to deliberate too much. I want to, when I get back to my studio and see the photos, be surprised at what I actually have. The photo itself is just uh, a marker. It marks a place and time, and it gives me uh, information about how something looks. Uh, but more importantly, it, it kind of poses questions that can only be answered through paint. I, I feel like I have a much healthier relationship to the photograph these days than I did before. It doesn't feel like a crunch. It, it feels like a, a catalyst for, for a thought process. This is a, a pool in Roswell I, and where I found that I really like lap swimming. And uh, swimming is, is the perfect activity for this feeling of disappearing because you, um, you're weightless and everything's blocked out except for your breathing. This is a painting of a, a great old theater in Sheridan, Sheridan Wyoming and the, and the blind dog that lived there. Um, there are some paintings that like know their identity from the outset, and they just have to, you know, be made. Like they follow their their own path, and and it's very clear. And and some paintings, like like this one, feel like a puzzle that needs to be solved. So it, it's waiting for like one thing, the right thing, and that might be an object or a you know a passage of paint or a shift in color, and then and then it can resolve itself. Other times. Um, other times, paintings like are, are nothing for the whole duration of the painting, and and then, and then I really feel like every I feel like a hamster in a wheel. Like every uh, decision is really arbitrary, and then and then all of a sudden, like abruptly, it can kind of snap into place. Uh, and this is the last painting I'll show you. This is uh, a painting in process. It's I, th I think it's pretty close to being done, um, uh, and I'm you know. This new this new group of work I'm I'm trying to finish for for the fairs in in Miami and yeah this one's probably going to be called cabinet okay that's it.